Well, we are back for another Beast Texas Breakdown Podcast. I'm your host, Serenity Douglas, joined by yours truly, Logan Ward. We're here to talk all things Beast Texas and more. Logan, thank you for joining me yet again. Hey, we're getting closer and closer to football season here in East Texas, and you can start to feel it. You are feeling yeah, it right now. I agree. I feel like the restaurants are getting ready. They're doing some <laughs> construction. You know, they're painting the lines on the field because it's about that time. It's getting there. We're yeah. like, what, a couple days away from two days starting and practice we starting. Are. We are. We're pretty much here. Every we week from now until February, there is a football game happening. <laughs> I think it's about time we could just say, we're here now. We're here. <laughs> We're here. Now, some things that we're going to be covering in our podcast today, the Dave Campbell preseason rankings just came out. We're also going to be covering some youth football camps that I got a chance to check out and the Olympics. How can we not talk about the Olympics? But for starters, the Dave Campbell preseason rankings. Now, you can't take rankings too, too serious, but... For this sake of this podcast, we're going to chat about it yeah. just to see, like, you know, like what's going on really. So, for starters, 6A, Longview was not in the top 25. They weren't even in the top 15. It was not a good look for them, but they are entered into a new classification. Yeah, Longview comes in uh, 6A, the first time that they've been in 6A since they won that state championship uh, in 2018. Uh, they come in at number 31 ranked in the Dave Campbell's uh, Texas high school football rankings. Uh, the only East Texas team that is in the rankings in 6A, granted we only have a couple, but uh, yeah, Longview, I mean, I think that this is kind of like, uh, you know, last year, the end of last season, ending in the playoffs in a, in a tough loss, um, I think that there's a lot of people around Lobo Nation that are ready to get this season going and to hopefully try to prove some of these people wrong, like Dave Campbell's Texas Magazine, not ranking yeah. them in the top 30, you know, the, right outside of the top 30 uh, in 6A. Yeah, I just think it's just like what people aren't realizing is that these rankings aren't just about how you did last year. It's about who's returning for your team. They're losing their key guy. I'm not just going to, like, get off of that point. Taylor Tatum, the best running back in the country, is um, going up to Oklahoma, and that's a big deal for them. Obviously, they will have a returner, Kelvin Washington. He made great gains last year, stepping in when, you know, Taylor Tatum can't do everything, but stepping in when Taylor Tatum ended up getting hurt. But that's a big part of it, and I think that's really what affected some of these rankings, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. This is kind of like a, a balancing act between how good you did last year and who you were bringing back. Um, and I think that you are seeing that if Taylor Tatum was back – this season they're probably in the top 20 in 6a but he is such an impactful player he was for the Lobos last season the last couple of years that when a guy like him leaves graduates and is now headed to Oklahoma it does affect in the rankings and a lot of this is just because there are a lot of unproven people yeah and uh, you know this is preseason we don't know the games haven't been played yet who knows by week six Longview could be right back in that top 25. It's just right now there's a lot of unproven, a lot of question marks around Longview simply because you don't have that dude and Taylor Tatum back there anymore. You don't have him. You don't have him, and also they're moving up into a new classification. Yeah. 6A is not, it's not easy, okay? You have to face teams like South Oak Cliff, and they do face them. Um, they're going to be playing Forney, North Forney, and it's just going to be a lot – a lot tougher for them, I must say. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it's interesting because Longview's actually predicted by Dave Campbell's to finish third in their district. Now, I I don't know. I have not looked up that number, but I don't know when the last time Longview was predicted to not be in the top two of their district. That would be an interesting stat uh, to look up. But Rockwall is predicted to win that, followed by Forney and then uh, Longview. Forney, of course, had an incredible run to the semifinals last year. Um, and so they brought back some players, did lose a couple of people. Uh, but Longview, I think, is just – they're just waiting. They're waiting for their opportunity, and they're going to get it in 6A. Like, they're going to get a lot of opportunities to prove themselves. Like you said, playing South Oath Cliff this season is going to be huge yeah. for the Lobos. And if they could somehow win that game, talking about preseason rankings versus what happens in the season, if they somehow beat South Oath Cliff, uh, that is in Longview. If they beat them – they will be a top 15 Absolutely. team there next week. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, undoubtedly. And South Oak Cliff, I want to say they won state last year. 
Um, and they lost to or, Port Natchez Grove. They Port Natchez, yeah, okay, they but lost, they were but they in the AT&T. One, right, exactly. Yes, so it's going to be a tough schedule for them, tough district. Longview has an opportunity. They start out the season at Lufkin, who we're going to get to here in just a minute with uh, 5A Division One. Mm-hmm. Uh, they start out the season at Lufkin, then they play at Marshall and then South Grove Cliff. If they go 3-0, they're going to be in the top 15, maybe the top 10 yeah. in 6A. So uh, this is all going to work itself out. Uh, and Longview can kind of look at maybe that top 15 and be like, that's where we want to be at the end of week three. Yeah. Like if, if we can get a couple of solid wins against Lufkin, Marshall, and especially South Coast Cliff, like we're going to be there yeah. where we want to be. Rank- rankings, they fluctuate. Absolutely. So, I mean, but like you said, 5A, D1, Lufkin, number 19. I mean, what can we really say about that one? 4A, D1. Number two, Chapel Hill. Now, this is like the big district. Number two is Chapel Hill. Number five, Kilgore. Number 16, Lindale. And then number 21 is Pine Tree. Yeah, so there are four teams in 4A Division I that are from East Texas, and all four of them are in the same district. Yeah. Uh, This is going to be a gauntlet (laughs) of a district. And we've talked about this before, um, and we kind of touched on it a little bit uh, earlier. It's like these teams play each other. They all play each other. Yeah. Like this this team in this district all play each other at some point in this year. Um, but not only is that, but Chapel Hill and Kilgore go play Gilmers and Carthages. Like they this is all a, the time. a stacked <laughs> schedule for all of these teams. And if you're looking at it from a totality, I think that this is one of the toughest districts for a Division One, nine four a Division One is one of the toughest districts in the state. I don't know how many other districts have four teams in the top 25 in their classification. We have one featuring all East Texas teams in 4A Division One. I. I mean, I, do, I absolutely agree. You know how all of the teams, they like to say, all gas, no breaks. This is literally all gas, no breaks. Yeah, like you were saying, the years before, yeah, they play each other. They're always on each other's schedule. But now it's like week one, week two, week three, week four, week five is just straight district play. And speaking of that, Kilgore and Pine Tree, they already have a rivalry between the Bulldogs and the Pirates. But now there's district implications on the line. And I know with last year, me going to that game, that was my first time there. I was like, okay. They really don't like each other here. So now it just means even more for them. And I think that that just puts more pressure on a lot of these teams. Yeah, exactly. And, and these teams have been playing each other for so long. Uh, Kilgore, Chapel Hill, Lindale. Pine Tree is kind of the new kid on the block in the district. But those teams have been playing each other non-district. Like you said, Kilgore and, and uh, Pine Tree played last season. They, they play each other. They have such familiarity with each other that it's a dogfight every week. In yeah. this in this uh, district, in this division, in 4A Division One, um, I do want to mention though we kind of touched on it with uh, with Longview of like returning starters um, because that is a big thing in these early preseason rankings and what we're seeing right now. There are a lot of question marks around some of these teams. Um, Kilgore, for example, is they're going to be replacing their quarterback, uh, which is a huge deal for them. They have a lot of returning starters on the defensive side. They have eight returning starters defensively, mm. um, but you're going to have to replace some key people and I think that that's kind of why they're number five and I will say this a lot of people are wondering why Chapel Hill is not number one because they lost in the state championship game last year and the team that they lost to Anna is now in 5A division two they're not even in the classification so naturally you would say okay maybe they move up and they are the number one team that's what a lot of people would think but Stephenville I think is returning they're returning a lot of starters it's a team that Every single year is really good. We saw them win a state title uh, two years ago. Uh, And so the returning starters for Chapel Hill, they lost six starters on the offensive side of the ball. And so that's going to be where a Stephenville jumps to number one because just of the returners that they have, uh, which is a a huge aspect of it. Of course, Chapel Hill still has two of those dudes and Demetrius Brisbane and Ricky Stewart that are back, which uh, I think is why they're kind of still in that the number two team in the state. I mean, they're the, they're the, the dynamic What doesn't show up on paper, sure. though, Demetrius is the experience Brisbane that they've gained. And Ricky gained. Stewart, they just work you know, so well off of each other. Our kids have played 45 games and, in three years. I mean, uh, Ricky's going to be going we, up to Texas, Demetrius with Baylor. So these guys are three-star, four-star three four athletes. So, I mean, 
to your point, though, returners is key, and that's the reason why they're ranked number two. Because, you know, Ricky and D can't do everything. Um, but I'm excited to see what Chapel Hill does. But moving right along to 4A, Division Two. Number one, no surprise here with Carthage. Now, I'm going to say no surprise. No, they didn't win last year because Kilmer did. And they're sitting right behind him. But Carthage, they're returning their quarterback. That's their main guy. Jet Surratt, coach's son, is coming back, and he is a dynamic quarterback. He knows how to um, sit in the pocket, and he knows how to run that ball. And I think that the fact that he's even gotten older this year and has developed means even more for the Bulldogs. And then we have Pleasant Grove at 7 and Van at 19. Yeah, this is, again, this is very similar to the conversation we just had with Gilmer and Carthage. Last year, Gilmer was the number one team in the state. They won the state title. Looking at 2024, Carthage is returning a lot of people, and they're returning the, a key position, obviously, in the quarterback. And I do feel like we are getting to the point with Carthage that if they just if they lose in the playoffs the year before, let's just pencil them in to be the number one team in state champs the next year. It just feels like if they don't get to that mountaintop, they're going to get to it the next season. Although I know that Coach Surratt will say that that's not the case and it's all this hard work and all this stuff. But it just <laughs> seems like people who uh, are from East Texas have seen this run. It just seems like that's the case. Like, okay, they didn't win state. They're going to win state the next season. Like, yeah. it's just it adds that motivation and that fire behind them. Uh, and, and if you look at Gilmer and you look at Carthage, these two teams – always battling it out in the playoffs. Yeah. Like, this is the 4A Division Two of Kilgore Chapel Hill. These two teams meet all the time, and whoever wins that game is usually going to be playing uh, deep, maybe go into Jerry's world. Uh, but I think that when Carthage loses in the playoffs – you pretty much just pencil them in that the next season they're going to be the number they're gonna one team take, in the state. They're going to take the ring. And, like, yes. I think that we just need to go ahead and bet on that right now because that's just what it's going to be. And, Gilmer, I will say that they have some returners, though. They have wide receiver Brendan Webb returning, but they are not having their main guy running back, Will Henderson, returning. He was a playmaker. Speedy Gonzalez he was. And he also won state, but he's going to be going up to UTSA. So he's that's a big loss for them. But Caden Tennyson at the quarterback spot – I heard that he might be um, making some switch arounds there. It's not confirmed yet, but for Gilmer, um, Caden Tennyson will be playing, um, I want to say, defensive back or running back as well on top of being a quarterback. Um, also, they're adding to the mix Brady McCown out of the McCown legacy of quarterbacks. So that's going to be really interesting to see what Gilmer is able to do this year. I am fascinated with what they're going to do, especially as we get into uh, practice starting next week as fall camps are rolling around. Um, it's going to be interesting because you do bring in a McCown who's obviously that is a quarterback family, but Tennyson can play. And, yeah. like, you're going to have to give him the ball. So is he going to be a quarterback? Is he going to be a spell quarterback? I know that he's going to be playing defensive back probably because that's where he projects to be at the next level, at the college level, and they want to give him some looks um, that way. But that's going to be a huge storyline coming up this oh, season. Oh, it for sure is, and I'm excited to report on it. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, he comes from a quarterback family, too. Yeah. Obviously not the extent of the McCowns, but Brandon, his brother, was the Gilmore quarterback as well. Um, so really interested to see what they're going to do. And we cannot sleep on Pleasant Grove at number seven. They always give Gilmer and Carthage a run for their money. But moving right along, 3A, Division One, number one, Malakoff, the reigning state champions there. I don't think that they're going to have the returning quarterback of who? Mike Jones. I don't know. But number 12, Winsboro is returning as well. And then 3A Division 2, we have number 2, Dangerfield, number 18, New Diana, and number 19, Wes Russ. It's going to be really interesting to see what these um, teams do, though. Yeah, watch out for Dangerfield. I know that they're okay. ranked pretty high, um, and I don't think that they're going to shock a lot of people and surprise a lot of people, but they're going to be really good this year. And Dangerfield always has had speed. That like, I don't know what is down there in Dangerfield, but they just have speed to just go. I mean, like it's, it's pretty <laughs> remarkable. And I think that Dangerfield is going to be a team that could give some of these uh, 3A Division II teams, like, a uh, real run for their money it, come the playoffs. Like, that Dangerfield, watch out. And Malakoff, I think that they're going to repeat. I, they do have Mike White back. I, I think that they're going to repeat, again, returning starters, especially when you get down to that 3A uh, level. Like, if you have a playmaker, how many times have we seen just, like, a playmaker win a lot yeah. of games? I mean, when you saw Timpson last year with Terry Bussey, just one dude and a lot of other really good supporting cast members, and you have one guy that can make everyone miss, um, or he's just that impactful of a player. I think that 
means a lot in those 3A classifications and 2A classifications and things like that. And Mike White is that guy. Like, he, he is a guy that's going to make a lot of people miss. He's going to do it with his legs and his arm, as we saw in the state title game last year. Uh, so, Malakoff, I think they're going to repeat. Uh, we'll see. Again, this is all just preseason. We're all it's just, all, we're just all talking. Just, yeah, we're just talking. You never really know. Don't get too sensitive. Now, moving on to East Texas youth camps. I got a chance to check some out earlier, and it's great. I think it's a great thing for the community. It's a great thing for a lot of these athletes. When I spoke to them um, during their player of the weeks, they like to say, well, I started, you know, in like the youth camps and I, I started, I know these coaches since I was in sixth and seventh and eighth grade. So like, this is nothing to come into high school and start really, really well. And that's the point of these youth camps. Um, I went out to Chapel Hills and they have age ranges from about four years old to 15 years old and that's insane so like second graders to ninth graders i also got a chance to go out to tyler legacy and check out some of their um guys as well and they look they look like prestigious yeah. out there like they really <laughs> had those guys being the quarterback like the young kids yeah. like snapping um snapping the ball and being like the quarterback for the receivers and like these little bitty guys and what i liked about them is that they had coach tryhan out there with them the head coach for the legacy uh, red raiders to be out there with them to get direction from a coach that might end up being their coach as well so i really like the youth camps and i think they're important yeah they are really important i think that you would ask a lot of coaches and they do think uh that those camps are important for just those younger kids because uh, you know a lot of these especially here in east texas like these are communities these are uh you know small communities these are small towns that this is their thing these little kids go to friday nights that is the biggest night of the week they get to go out and watch these players play on friday night lights and so you're building a foundation even if they're six years old you're building a foundation that you know you are a carthage bulldog you are a pine tree pirate you are a lufkin panther you are a longview lobo and if you build that young you can kind of build uh you know the the excitement to be a part of the program yeah. and and a lot of coaches will tell you like once they get into like that sixth and seventh grade as they start to get into middle school and you're about to get into the actual football uh, for the school They'll, they'll start teaching you some of the schemes and stuff that oh, they use yeah. at the varsity level. Oh, it's serious. So that you have, you have like four or five years before you get to, you know, your junior season of working with the, exactly what you're going to be doing on Friday nights. Like, it's, it's a, a really impactful thing. Uh, and you can also catch out uh, Serenity's package on CBS19.tv. Absolutely. It will be there. Uh, <laughs> it will be there for you to check out about those youth camps. No, absolutely. They are, they are really important. They are very important, like you said. Like, um, when I spoke to Coach Trihan, he was just saying, I'm trying to make it muscle memory for them. And that says a lot because, yeah, you're teaching these guys the schemes, just like you were saying, yes. But the things that are in football that are, like, unexplainable, they just know it. And the way you just know it is when you start this age and when it makes it feel like, okay, we're really a part of a team here and it, um, you're not feeling young. I would say that. And I don't think that any of them made them feel like kids out yeah. there. Like they were making some plays. I was getting a lot of good footage. So yes, make sure y'all tune into CBS 19 tonight for that package, but we're going to keep on moving right along <laughs> here. Logan, we have the 2024 Paris Olympics and all I can say so far is wow. Because, awesome. oh my goodness, it has <laughs> been crazy. I've been really into, first of all, everything, let's just say that, but really into gymnastics, swimming, but we got we to gotta brag on the gymnasts. Oh, um, yeah. Starting off with the men's, they have not gotten an Olympic medal since 2008. Now, it's the men's team final so far. Um, they have not gone into individuals, but they have not gotten an Olympic medal since 2008. That's 16 years. And the one to do it, the Pommel Horse King, Mr. Steve Nadorshik. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The way he came in. Let me just set the scene for oh, you. Yes, please do. Let me just set the scene. He did not have any other thing to compete in. So he was just there the whole two hour meet and he got to watch his teammates do a fantastic job. Um, like Frederick, it was just it was it was great. They were doing great and representing. And then he came out there with his glasses. He was like meditating. He's like, I got this. And now he's like a meme everywhere. Yeah. And then he got up there. They said that he can't even um, see without his glasses. That's what kind of blew me as well. I know, yeah. He said he that has like a, a stigmatism. Dangerous. Yeah, he said he has a stigmatism. So he just kind of like feels what he's doing, but he can't see it for real. But he came out there. He stuck his landing. It was beautiful. It got the guys the bronze medal. 
chef's kiss I had chills and then obviously the women's team came right along they did the same but even better they got the gold medal Jordan Childs Simone Biles Sunny Lee it was absolutely amazing yeah uh, you know I think that at this point we should just accept that Simone Biles is maybe the greatest thing to happen to America. Like she Absolutely. has, she has been <laughs> so good for Team USA since she started, uh, and now she's the most decorated U.S. Olympian of all time. Like her, she gymnast, uh, excuse me, but she's incredible. She has five gold medals. Like, five gold medals. Is, that is wild. She's 27 years old. The Olympics only comes around every four years. That's insane. And she's like one of the oldest gymnasts to win. This is a the gold old. Medal. So yeah, this is the one of the oldest teams because, and that's crazy to say because yeah, she's, she's twenty seven, yeah. and I want to say Jordan Childs is only maybe like 22, yeah. 23, but this is technically the oldest team and eight total Olympic medals, five gold. I think it is pretty remarkable that when you say like she's twenty seven, and this is something that only comes around every four years, and yet she's still has five yeah. gold medals. Yeah. Like, that, that is very hard to impute. And she's competing all over. She's doing teams. She's doing individual. Like, she's doing it all. Yeah, she is. And I know that they have, like, some moves named after her, and that's a pretty big thing. Yes. Now, look, I don't have a – I'm not a gymnast. I've never <laughs> been to the gym and done a flip, so, like, I can't uh, talk to – I've never been to the gym and done a flip. <laughs> I've never done it. I've never done a flip uh, in my life. Uh, so I can't necessarily talk about the technique – of, of uh, Simone Biles, but I can tell you this, it's mesmerizing to watch. She's oh, incredible, is. and I know that she wins, and I like winners. Yeah, and that's just that. <laughs> no, she looks fantastic. Yeah, the moves that they've named after her, I want to say it's like the Biles one, and she's about to attempt, and to hear the commentators say this, oh, Simone Biles is about to attempt the Simone Biles 2.0, <laughs> 2.5. Like, that's absolutely ridiculous. She is just on a completely another level. And what I love to see as well, seeing Michael Phelps and seeing Serena Williams going out there and supporting her, I'm like, it's like goat talk to goat and another go. Yeah. And um, just very proud of the whole team. I'm like Team USA out. Track and field starts pretty soon. So we're really excited to see Jerrion Lawson competing in long jump. He's an East Texas native. So Shout out to the women's rugby team, too. Women's rugby. Winning a bronze is the yeah. first time their team has ever won an Olympic medal. And they won it in dramatic fashion, like pretty much at the buzzer uh, against Australia. A huge upset. Yeah. Um, I've... I've been fascinated. I love the Olympics because it's obviously something that comes around every four years and things that we don't watch often. Yeah. But being absolutely enthralled by table tennis and badminton. Exactly. And, like, I am just – I am all in on everything. Every well, minor that's the point of the sport, Olympics. I am dialed yeah. in. And it is awesome, especially because, like, I mean, we're the USA. We're, we win a lot. Yeah. We do win a lot. USA. Yeah, that's all I keep saying over and over and over again. USA. Yeah, like you were saying, everybody just comes together. I was watching BMX today. Never have seen it before. Um, didn't even know that it was an Olympic event. But we're cheering hard. But I'm cheering. Like, I mean, and oh, USA, he just he just clipped himself and he ended up falling. And I was just so hurt about it. But, yeah, you're right. I've been watching badminton. I've been watching water polo. I, I, I think found equestrian. Myself I found myself, oh, speaking of, like, they were doing horse racing through this, mm -hmm. like, really scenic part of France, and I was just mesmerized. Yeah. They were jumping over rocks and, like, <laughs> through trees and stuff. It was incredible. But I found myself this weekend watching swimming and actually screaming at the TV oh, yeah. for them to go faster. Yeah. And, like... I don't know what got into me. I usually only do that when the Cowboys are doing something bad. <laughs> but for whatever reason, something just came over me, and I started yelling about the Team USA swimming. I'm excited. I mean, so I completely understand. I mean, I'm ready to see Katie Ledecky. Man, I've been watching her since I was younger. I know. So, I mean, just so much to watch, so much to look forward to. But... We're going to be giving you all the updates for everything East Texas and beyond. But thank you all for tuning in to episode two of the Beast Texas Breakdown Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Serenity Douglas. Thank you so much for joining, and make sure you tune into all the podcasts on CBS19.tv.